Awesome, so seems like we are live now. I'm gonna make you host and then you will have to make me co-host back again. Okay. Okay, I think we should be set. Awesome, I have paused the recording and once the time comes on, I will be sure to start it. Very good, thank you, Michael. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to have you here on such a bright and sunny day, at least where I am. If you would like to uh, unmute and say hello, I'd love to hear where you're from and what you might be interested in learning specifically about crochet today. Hello. I'm Sherry. Hi. Hi, Sherry. I'm in, I'm in Frederick, Maryland. Nice. And I just love crochet toys and I want to learn how to make them. Okay. Do you already know how to crochet, Sherry? No. Okay. No, I, All right. I, can, so, I can knit though. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. So if you can knit, you could probably pick up crochet. The okay. trick is all in how you hold your how you hold your yarn and your hook, which you've already mastered with knitting. So, um, so I hope this I hope this helps you. Okay, good. Thank you. Others, you're welcome. Others, what are you hoping to learn today? Anything specific? And where are you from? Morning. Hi, Virginia. Hi, Kalamazoo, Michigan. Oh, lovely. I am also in Michigan. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Okay. Just getting the basics, just learning basics. I'm a knitter, but okay, um, yeah. Right. I'm, a, I'm a, I'll say I'm a knitter too, and I just want to learn just how to the chain and to cast down and do a simple stitch. So great, you're in the right spot because that's exactly what we're covering today. Other people, what are you hoping to learn today, or where are you from? I'm. I'm from um, Connecticut. This is me. <laughs> is it Meryl? Is that how you say yeah. your name, Meryl? Yes. Pretty name. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, um, you're welcome. I, I can knit a little bit, um, but I'd really like to learn how to crochet, so. Okay, great. Sounds like there's a lot of knitters on board today. Karen, are, what are you interested in learning today? Same thing. I, I can knit a dishcloth, but I'd like to learn how to crochet one. <laughs> okay, you're in the right spot. All right, I'm going to go ahead because we have a lot to cover in this hour. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get started. I'm going to share my screen um, so that you can see my presentation. Um, and hopefully by the time we get done, you will feel like you can at least uh, give it a good try. If you want to follow along with um, with this today, you're welcome to do that. If you've already got a crochet hook and some yarn, you know, feel free to try it. Um, but I'll also tell you how you can do follow up with it. So this is Learn to Crochet with Get Set Up and I'm your guide, Sarah. Um, I live in Everett, Michigan, right in the middle of the Lower Peninsula. I spent 22 years in education. I'm a recently retired elementary principal. Um, and I spent two years as an outreach uh, specialist for Michigan State University, which was definitely a highlight of my career. Um, I was able to help um, schools who were falling behind academically. And that was, that was uh, it was challenging and it was very, very rewarding. I'm 
I quote, so I don't know if you do, but one of my favorites is this one. People do the best they can with what they know. And when they know better, they do better. And when I learned about what that quote means to me is I am a lifelong learner. I just love to learn. And I, I believe that as long as I'm alive, I can learn something new. So when I ran across Get Set Up on my Facebook feed back in January, I thought, oh my gosh, this just is totally fits with my philosophy of life and um, I became a guide and um, I think it's a great partnership because obviously they have the same um, idea that I do and that's that people like to learn no matter how old they are. Um, I'm gonna open my chat box I think in case anybody wants to say anything. Um, lost my chat box. Hmm. All right, so I'm going to keep going. If you have a question, though, go ahead and put it in the chat box, or you can unmute yourself and ask directly, and that's fine. So get set up. We learn from each other. So I, I though I'm teaching um, crochet and some other beginning craft skills, um, I am not an expert in anything. I just, uh, I just enjoy it, and I'm good at it, and I love to share what I'm passionate about. So I can learn from you just as well as you can learn from me. I, I love it when your cameras are on because then I can see your expression and I can tell whether you're getting it or not by maybe, you know, if it's confusing, I can read your frown. So that's a lot harder to do when I can't see your faces. But obviously, if you want to keep your camera off, that's okay. When we get done today, if you say, oh, I really wish I knew how she did that chain stitch again, you can order a copy of today's recording um, by emailing help at getsetup.io um, and ask for Sarah's class on Learn to Crochet from today. And they'll send you a recording and you can watch it. What's nice about the recording is you can queue it up right to where you need it. Um, if you're joining us by live stream today, and my understanding is we are live streaming, I'd like to welcome you. I'm glad you're here. Um, but just know if you'd like to be interactive with us, you just have to hop on over to the website and um, register for a class that way. And then you can be with me in Zoom and you can ask your questions. I love the direct participation. Um, Get Set Up, nor I am paid to promote specific products. So obviously in the craft world, I have my favorite things and I can't help but talk about those favorite things. Um, just know that I'm not paid to promote them, nor is Get Set Up paid to promote those. It's just things that I've found that work for me um, that I might suggest and you might be uh, wanting to try. <clears throat> As I've already said, feel free to put any questions you might have in the chat box or unmute yourself and ask. So um, here's the agenda for today. Uh, by the time we get done, I'm, hope you're, I'm hoping you will be able to choose the right supplies. I'm hoping you'll be able to do a slip knot and a chain stitch. I'm hoping you'll be able to do a single crochet stitch and I'll be sharing some tips and tricks when I get done. Um, I will tell you that um, I developed, actually I worked on it on Saturday of this weekend, my intermediate crochet class. And so if, if this beginner class is, you know, if you already know the things that I'm gonna share with you here, I believe my um, intermediate crochet class will be launching either next week or the week following. So I've gotten approval for it. It just has to be uploaded into the system. So I've already heard from some of you that you're hoping this, many of you, it sounds like already knit and you're hoping to pick up crocheting as well. Would anyone else like to share something that they're hoping to get out of the class today? Hi, um, I actually don't knit, nor do I crochet or even sew. My mother had done at least the crocheting and sewing. I'm just curious just to see whether I can do it. I actually signed up for an in-person class here in Cincinnati where I live. So I thought this might be a little bit of kind of a, a, a jump start for me. I, I bet it will be. Um, do you have a crochet hook and yarn in front of you right now? I do not. I'm actually, because okay. the, cl the class I'm taking that's in person will start later this week. I was going to go out and get some supplies. Get it. Okay. Yeah. So
Okay, well, you may at least at least you'll be able to know what you might want to pick up before the class starts unless you got a supply list from them. Um, but even if you got a supply list, if you've never done this before, walking in, if you, I don't know if you guys have done this lately, most of you I think are ladies, if you've done this recently or not, but you walk into a Joann's in the yarn section and the choices are overwhelming. Um, and so one of the things that we're gonna we're gonna cover today is how to get the right supplies for your project. So I'm gonna skip this because we've been doing that already. So here's the supplies that you might need to crochet. So you, a pattern, unless you're like my good friend Kay, who is able to say, oh, I wanna make a shirt and she can just do it. I don't understand that. I work from patterns all the time. You're gonna want some yarn. You're gonna want a crochet hook. You'll need scissors um, and then you can optionally add a yarn or a darning needle and that um, that looks like this. Um, I don't know if you can see that very well, but this is a this is a it's a big eye blunt tip needle and that's my favorite way of weaving in the ends when I get done. Um, but you can also do it with a crochet hook. So if you don't want to get a yarn or a darning needle, you don't have to. And more advanced, uh, a more advanced supply would be stitch markers. You won't need that for what we're uh, covering today. Any questions right now on the supplies? Okay. So the first thing we're gonna cover is how to read a yarn label. Um, and this is very, very helpful when you get into that yarn section in, a, in one of the big box craft stores or heaven forbid you walk into a yarn shop. Um, the one that I loved, uh, that's about an hour from me where I live now, um, it has two rooms with yarn everywhere and it, it, it can be really overwhelming. So let's talk about this real quick. So there's several things on a label. Um, one of them is the weight of the yarn that's designated with a number. And this number is generally between one and nine. Now this number, what that's talking about is if I were to take one of these threads out, that's telling you basically how big a round um, that single strand of yarn is. So the average yarn is four. So a lot of lots and lots and lots and lots of projects have fours. Um, when I was young and I learned how to crochet and I went into a store and got a skein of acrylic yarn, it was a four, but they didn't label it with numbers back then. They called, they might've called it worsted weight. They might've called it four ply yarn, which might be where that original four came from. Um, but that's kind of what I would consider an average skein of yarn is this number four. And that's what I'll be using today um, in, our, in our practice session together. And then it's gonna tell you the weight of this skein. So this whole piece of yarn, this whole ball of yarn is called a skein. And it's telling us right here, and you may not be able to see it, but this says seven ounces. If you're joining me from the UK, for example, it also tells me the weight in grams. So why I need to know this is if my pattern tells me that it's going to be need nine ounces to complete the top that I'm going to do, then I know that I need to get two skeins because one is not gonna be enough. The other thing that the pattern may also tell you is how many yards or how many meters are in the skein. And in this case, it's 415 yards or 380 meters. Sometimes the pattern will tell you both. Sometimes it will tell you in ounces. Sometimes it will tell you in yards. So just you have to look at your pattern and see what it's telling you. So you're looking at, first of all, the, the size of the yarn itself, then you're looking for the weight of the skein or the length of the skein or both. The next thing the skein tells us, this label tells us is the fiber content. In this case, it's 90% acrylic and it's 10% alpaca wool. Why that's important to know is that's going to determine the maybe the use so like if I'm going to make a dishcloth, I would never choose acrylic yarn because I don't like the way it feels when I wash my dishes. I want something that's 100% cotton. Or if it's got wool in it, how much wool? Because then that's going to impact my washing instructions. So you want to know your fiber content. 
down at the bottom, there's these cute little icons and there's a little chart over here, but it also says it in writing below what your washing instructions are. And you need to know that. Now, one of the things that I uh, knit with quite frequently is 100% wool that's untreated. And I knit, when you knit with 100% wool, um, the goal, my goal is to knit whatever it is larger and then I shrink it in hot water. I, I purposely wash it in hot water with a pair of blue jeans and shrink it down. And I'll show you an example of that in my photos at the end today. But I have to make sure that it's untreated so that it will shrink. But you certainly don't want to spend all your time and effort on something, uh, on a great project that you forgot to check the content on and you find out that it is 100% wool and you wash it and now it fits your dog instead of your grandchild. <laughs> so it's kind of an important thing to know. And then last but not least, this label is going to tell us about the gauge. And what this means is when the average person crochets or knits with this yarn, um, what size is it going to turn out? I'm going to go to, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to zoom in on this on a different skein of yarn so you can see what I'm talking about. So we're crocheting today, so we're only going to look at the, uh, the crocheting icon. But if you're a knitter, you might already be familiar with this. What this is telling me is before I get started on a project, and especially if it's a project that I want uh, to fit a certain way. So like if it's a piece of clothing for me, or one time I made American, a, a beautiful American girl doll outfit, and I didn't swatch it out ahead of time, and it, it literally fell off the doll. Um, so if it's important that it fits, you're going to want to do your swatching ahead of time. If you, if, if a, a dishcloth, I probably would never do it because I don't really care how big the dish, if it's a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller. But if it's important, you're going to want to do this. And what this is telling us that is if we took this yarn, which is a medium four, if we took this yarn, it's probably acrylic. It looks acrylic by what I can see. Oh, yeah, it says it's 100% acrylic. If I take a J crochet hook and I do 12 stitches across and that's usually it's talking about single crochet when it's telling you this if I do 12 stitches across and I crochet for 15 rows it should turn out four by four inches square now I know from experience because I've crocheted for a long time that I am a loose crocheter so I know automatically when I pick something up, I'm gonna go down at least one hook size, um, maybe even two if it's, and if, again, if it's really important, I'm gonna swatch it out, but I know that I am looser than the average crocheter. If you happen to be a tight crocheter, um, which you know I, I've met people that are, you, you may wanna go up a size or two. And once you know that about yourself, you can guess at your swatching a lot easier. Um, any questions so far on picking out the yarn or doing a swatch? I have a question about the needle. My, and excuse my parrot in the background, she's being noisy. My needle doesn't have a, um, a letter value. It has numerical value. It's, uh, for example, I knew that what you were asking for was an I, and mm -hmm. I looked it up and it said 5.5 millimeter, but all, you know, unless I look it up every time, is there yeah. a rule of thumb? Uh, I don't think there's a rule of thumb. I think, and I don't like it when they do that, Mary. Um, mine has, like my hook that I used for the project today has, and I know you can't see it, but on the, where you hold your fingers, it has both. And so, you know, I would always, when I go to buy it, I try to make sure it's got both on there. Um, a lot, and or a lot of times, many times, the patterns will say, like in this case, the J is a five point, or sorry, this is an I or a nine or a 5.5. And a lot of times the pattern will tell you that too. So um, now if you, for today, that's what I'm using. But if you have a smaller one or a bigger one, that's fine. You can go down as small as an F and still work comfortably on the yarn that I'm going to show you today. And you can go up probably as high as a J. 
probably as high as a K. It's going to turn out really loose if you use a K, but that range is, is OK. So let's talk about that hook for a minute. Great segue, Mary. Um, there's several parts to a crochet hook. Um, there's this pointed end, and that's what you're going to use to poke through your stitches. So it's good that it's pointy on the end. This part, uh, this part right here where the, where the hook is, is called the throat. And that's what you're going to be grabbing and pulling your yarn with is that throat. The shaft is what I would call the working part of the um, of the hook. Um, and it's also determines the crochet hook. So when it says 5.5, whatever it was, mill millimeters or yeah, millimeters, it I think it's the measurement around that part of the crochet hook hook now mary what i want to say is i want to say they go up by half millimeter increments i'm just not sure that that's true um, but if you looked up a chart um i it might very well say that but I, I think maybe when it gets smaller it could go down by quarters um, but i'm i'm just not 100 percent sure on that then there's the grip and i want to show you i've got three kinds of crochet needles here crochet hooks. I use the word needles and hooks interchangeably. Sorry about that. So this is the hook that I'm using for today. This hook is massive and you can either use a bulky yarn or I've even used this and I'll show you at the end to crochet fabric into a rug, fabric strips into a rug. This one, I'm guessing you can't even see the hook on this one. This is a thread crochet hook and you use cotton crochet thread instead of yarn. And it's a kind of same stitches, but it's a different skill set. So when I go back to these two needles, this one has that grip on it. This one doesn't. And that grip makes a great deal of difference to me as far as your dexterity when you're working. So if you have a choice, try to get that grip on your hook. Uh, the other thing, so you've got your grip and then you've got your handle and the handle is the part that rests in your hand while you're crocheting. So that's that's where the handle goes. There's two things and I looked this up on purpose. There's two, two kinds of hook or throat. That's this part right here that this is demonstrating. There's the inline and there's the tapered. The inline, I've gone through my crochet box and thrown out every single uh, crochet hook that I've got that has this inline um, throat on it because it's harder to grab the thread. And if you're learning especially, I would recommend this. I'm not saying this won't work. It's just that when I'm, if I'm crocheting and I'm going kind of quickly, I want it to stay in that in that throat. I don't want it to slip out. And I have found that with the inline, it does slip out. So I do think it's worth the time um, to check, uh, to check when you buy your hook to see if it's an inline or a tapered hook. Any questions on the hook itself? Yes, I have a question. Now, I just have one here and, I, and it, I'm reading it and it says K Ten and a half. Is that telling me that this is larger than what you're using, Sarah, and that my crocheting will be looser, or it's just the right? Correct. And it's okay. It's okay because we're just practicing. That hook is two sizes bigger than mine. Really? Um, and the yeah, and the and the K. So does yours tell you how many min millimeters around? It says. 6.5, no, 6.5 mm. Yeah, yeah, and mine is 5.5. So Mary, that goes back to yours. That's that's two half sizes or one whole size, one whole millimeter bigger. Um, yeah, it's just going to be a little bit looser. So what, Grisha, Grisha is it Grisha or Grisha? It, it's Grisha. And I'm also looking, and I think, I'm glad you called this to my attention. I think it's tapered because... I, it looks to me from the picture that I should have one that's, or it looks like I should have the second one that you have in the picture instead of the first one. You hold it so it's, so I can see it in your camera sideways. How do I, can you see me? I don't. I see you. So hold you, it right in front of your nose. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that looks good to me. It does? No, that looks 
Yeah, it looks good to me. Doesn't it look like the first one that you said it makes it harder to pull it through? My eyes aren't great, Sarah, but I, it looked to me. It looks, I think it looks okay. I think it looks like the right one. You do? Okay. I I'll do. Go, go. <laughs> I do. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. So, what, Grisha, what you might want to do is instead, I think I, I want to, I'd have to look ahead, but I think, I, I think I've got you chaining like 35. You may want to chain more like 30 with that bigger hook so that your dishcloth doesn't end up like a blanket. Okay. And I think I probably would, I've never, I've not done it, but chain loose, which would make it even bigger. So I better, I'm either going to have to get a smaller hook, I think. But anyway, not to take time with it. I'll, we'll see. Thank you. I understand and then an example, I think is always helpful. So for today's pattern, we're using cotton crochet yarn. Um, I forgot to take out my my uh, skein here. Hold on one second. When you go into the crochet section, you'll be able to spot the cotton really quick because the cotton is usually in this more squat shaped skein rather than the elongated skein. And they're usually all together in one section. So today I'm using 100% cotton crochet yarn that is medium weight or four. Um, I'm using a crochet hook size I or a nine or a 5.5 millimeter. I could always add that and some scissors. So you feel free to follow along or remember if you want to, you can order a copy of the, um, of the video when we get done. So this is the basic pattern, chain 35, and then you're gonna single, and I'm gonna explain all of this, but I, I did this for people that already maybe know a little bit about crocheting, single crochet in the second chain from the hook and in each chain across, I'm gonna send you this pattern when we get done in the follow-up um, email. And then at the end, you're gonna chain one and turn, single crochet across every stitch, every row until it's approximately square. And I determined, um, I, I, I think I have later in here how big, it, this is my finished one, it's pretty good size. Um, but I determined it was square by just simply folding it quarter to corner to corner in a triangle. That's how I knew it was square when I got done. I did, and, and then I said, oh, it's about this many rows long. But remember, if you're a tighter or a looser crocheter, you may end up with a different number of rows than me. And then you're going to tie off and weave in your ends. <clears throat> so starting the yarn. Or not. Um, so I'm not, I'm, I'm going to actually, I'm going to skip this video, but I'm going to tell you what to do. So in your skein, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go to the center. You work your fingers into the center of your skein, pulling out as very little of the very center as you can at a time. You just pull that out and start your yarn from your center. Well, what that does is a it, it keeps your yarn from getting dirty because it pulls fluidly from the center once you get it done. So let's see if I can find my end of this one here. I got a mess going on this one, uh, but it just it just literally it pulls fluidly once you find your center point. Um, here's a better example. I've got this one. This one is uh this yarn is um it's it's also got some bamboo in it and I'm making a dishcloth with it just to try it to see, but I pulled my center out and now it just literally pulls out like this without ever moving the ball and it protects your yarn. Um, and then you don't have to ball it either. Um, the only yarn you have to ball anymore is if you are those that are specialty yarns uh, and you usually would find those in a knitting uh, a yarn store specifically. Um, you wouldn't probably find it. It's called a hank. I was saying shank last week. It's really a hank. Um, it's called a hank of yarn, and that has to be balled before you can use it. But most of the big box stores don't even sell it that way. All Sarah, right. can yeah. I ask you a quick question? Is there a way to know which end to pull it from? By end, I mean pulling it from the center because I know there isn't. You're just by luck. No. You'll, is there a right or wrong <laughs> one? No, there's not. Um, oh, okay. The only thing I would, I would caution you on is sometimes the outer end of it, um, they'll tuck it in the end and you have to get that out of the way. 
Um, but yeah, and I just pull as little as I can. And if there's too much extra, I just wind it around until I get that used up. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so here's the slip knot. Oh, let me do this. So this is going to demonstrate making a slip knot. Um, here's the end of your yarn right here. Um, and at the tail, wherever your tail is. And I go, oh, I don't know, three, three inches off or so, pick it up and just curl it around so that it makes a loop. So that this tail is crossing the part that's coming out of the skein itself. And then you just take this tail, poke it up underneath and, and grab it. And then holding on to the, both the tail and the part coming out of the skein with your right hand and the loop with your left, you're gonna, you're gonna tighten that down to make your slip knot. And, and then you can adjust it um, by pulling on the thread so or yarn. And um, when you do that, then that makes your beginning stitch so that you can begin your, first, for example, your first crochet stitch or your first knitting stitch. But the slip knot is important because um, it's exactly the right size because of the way you can tighten it. And it also can be pulled right out like magic. See? There are probably a hundred ways to make a slip knot. And I did that one on a, I was using a towel as my basis so that you could see what I was doing, but I generally do it around my fingers. Um, you can, if you can't figure out the slip knot, it's not a big deal. You can just make a little loop in a knot. It's just, um, I just like the ability to size it to my needle. I like that a lot. Okay. This video is how, so I'm going to show you two different videos. The first one is how to hold the hook. And then I'm going to show you how to hold the yarn. So this is just how to hold the hook itself. So let's just uh, talk about the crochet hook itself for just one minute. Uh, let's identify the parts first. You've got your tip, which is right here. You've got your throat or this inside part of the hook called the throat right there. This is your working area. This is the part that goes in and out of your stitches. And then there's always this grip area right here where you hold it. And then there's the handle of the hook. So those are the parts of the hook. There's two kinds of common holds for a crochet hook. One, which is my favorite, is what they call the pencil grip. And basically I'm holding this crochet hook in my hand uh, like a pencil with my uh, thumb and my pointer finger on the grip. So it's, I'm holding it like this. Um, the second way to hold it is what they call the knife hold. Not my favorite, but Vanna White loves it. And it looks like this, where you're holding it. You're it's still between your thumb and your pointer finger, but you're holding it in this position. Let me show you it from this angle. Um, and those are, the, those are the two most popular holds. Any questions about holding the hook? Vanna White, you know, she's the letter turner for Wheel of Fortune. And um, when she started with uh, Wheel of Fortune, she was uh, crocheting on set. And she's actually published at least one book. I own one of her um, books with patterns in it. She made crocheting quite popular back then. My understanding is that both crocheting and knitting are on the surge right now and counter cross stitch because of the pandemic. People are starting to pick up some, some um hobbies that they haven't had time to do maybe. Okay, so now we're going to put holding the yarn together with holding the hook. And if you can master this, you can master crocheting. So to hold the yarn and the hook together, you have your slip knot already made, and then you've got your hook. Pick up your hook and put it through your slip knot. Tighten your slip knot down, but not too tight. You want to be able to make sure your hook can come through it. So you want to tighten, excuse me, tight, but not too tight. Then you wrap your, your yarn around your first finger. This is the way I hold it. There's lots of ways to hold your yarn. This is my preferred way. And then you grab a hold of the knot 
with your middle finger and your thumb. So, so right there. And then I like to use that pencil grip. And so I have wrapped my bottom two fingers around the working yarn that leads to the skein. So the, the total hold is wrap around your finger, first finger, hold the knot with your middle finger and your thumb, and you hold your working yarn with your ring finger and your little finger. So this is the position for holding the yarn. And to make the first chain, we're going to have the throat of the hook right here facing us. And we're going to go from the front to the back and from underneath to up above and turn the hook right here using the, the grip as a guide so that the throat is now facing down. We grab the yarn and bring it through the loop on the hook and that is our first chain. Okay, any questions on holding the hook or the yarn? So the chain stitch is the basic foundation. I'm sorry, let me pause that just a second, make sure nobody has a question. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. So now I'm gonna now I'm gonna demonstrate actually making a chain. For most crochet projects. Um, it's your it's your base row begin mechanism. So in this starting right here, I've already done my slip knot. I put it, my crochet hook through it. I've got my yarn held uh, in its proper manner, and to make that first chain uh, with the throat of the hook facing me, I go in front of the yarn, under it, go up on top of it, and then turn my throat. So that it's pointed down toward the ground, grabbing the yarn and pulling it through. Now you can see as I pull it through that I'm tugging, also tugging slightly down to make room for the, the point of the, of the um, throat to go through this. Now, if you find that you've just tightened that slip knot down so much that you can't get it through, a trick that you can use is to slide your hook um, slide this, uh, the handle part of it, the grip, slide it right through that and back and it loosens it back up again. So that's a, that's just a little trick you can do when you're getting started. If you're, if you're pulling it too tight and you can't get your needle to come through, loosen it up with that grip. Stitch. And that is what that first stitch looks like. Now, if you got in today's lesson, we're going to be making a washcloth. And so we're going to do 33 or so of these, so I'll double check that in, uh, in a minute. But it was 35 in the pattern. So it would look like this. I have one, now there's two, there's three, and then it starts to feel kind of awkward or loosey-goosey, and so I just simply move my uh, thumb and my middle finger up, back right under the needle, and I usually do two to three chains. Um, before I adjust my fingers again and move up. There's three more. There's three more. And that's how you make the chain. Now I, 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 I do want to tell you when I said that, I said that's your foundation row. But if you're looking at a pattern, it's not going to say row one chain. It's going to tell you how many to chain and then it's going to tell you how to work your first row. So truly the chain is the foundation, but it's not a row, if that makes sense. All right, so now I'm going to show you how to count. Let's see how many chains we've actually made. And so we want to know how to identify the individual chains. Um, I like to think of it when I look at it this way, kind of in a vertical way, I like to think of these as V's. Um, so here's the left part of the V and the right part of the V, that's one chain stitch. So this is the initial chain that was on the hook when I started, that was the slip knot. That's the first chain, so it would be one, two, three, four, 
five, six, seven. Let me tug this up a straight a little bit. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Now what we don't count is the loop that's on its hook. So we have to remember that, that we're counting the ones that are completed, not the ones that are on the hook. So there's 12. The other thing that is good to know is if you weren't like a row, so a horizontal look, this would be the top loop. Or you know, this would be the top loop. This would be the bottom loop. And if we turn it over, we can see the we can tell the front from the back easily because the back has the bump. And there's actually a way you can use these bumps when you start your second row, but we'll, we'll save that for our advanced class. Right now, when we get ready to start our single crochet row, we're going to use that top of the chain. All right. Any questions before I hit play on the single crochet stitch? All right. We're making progress. We're going to begin our uh, single crochet row at this point. Um, and so I've got 12 chains made on my um, sample. And I've got my working loop on my hook. Um, and I'm going to begin my first stitch in the second chain from the hook. Now, most often, your pattern is going to tell you where to start. Rule of thumb for just a basic single crochet pattern would be to start in the second chain from the hook. We don't start in the first one because you can see that our, our yarn goes through that first one. We would actually undo what we've already done if we went in that first one, which is why we go in the second one. So I'll tighten this back down, tighten my loop back down, and um, I, I wind my thread exactly the same, turn my chain. So now instead of, instead of going down or working over from the right, now it's now it's horizontal and I'm going to use my hook and I'm going to say, oh, I don't want to go in that first chain stitch. I want to go in the second. And so um, to get my fingers out of the way, I'm actually going to use the knife hold for a minute because I think you can um, see it better in the knife hold. I'm going to take the tip of the crochet hook. I'm going to go through the top loop of the chain. I'm going to go right through there with my tip. And that's why you need that tip is for that poking. I'm going to go from underneath. I'm going to, with the throat pointed toward me, I'm going to grab the thread and turn it as I come back through. And I'm going to pull it up straight, putting two level. loops on my hook. Or level. So once I've got the two loops, I'm going to move my needle back hook back to that, the throat facing me, and, and go under the thread, turning the hook to that down position, and pulling the loop through both loops here. And that completes my first single crochet stitch. To do the second one, I go in the loop right next door. So you go down through the top, right in that center part under the top loop, through, grab the thread, turning the needle, pull it back through, putting two loops on the hook. And it's always good to try to kind of have those uh, in equal tension um, between those two loops. And I'm gonna go over here, I'm gonna get, grab my thread from underneath, turn and pull through both. There's my second one. Move my fingers over. I'm going to put my pointer, uh, my tip of my hook through under that top loop through the center of the chain stitch. I'm going to grab the thread, pull it back through, and put, and now I've got the two loops on my hook. I'm going to wrap and pull through two. So down through, grab it, up two on the hook. Wrap and pull through, grab it, two on the hook, wrap it and pull. 
I'm going to switch to my pencil position so that you can see how I hold it in the pencil position. So I've got my, my working loop. I go through the center of the stitch, wrap and pull, putting two loops on the hook, wrap and pull through two. Through, pull, wrap, pull. 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 Did anybody try it? And were you able to do it if you did? Grisha, I don't, Grisha, I, I don't, I, if you're talking, I can't hear you. I think you're not, I think you're muted. Still muted. <laughs> Still muted. Oh, there she goes. Still muted. <laughs> Still muted. Um, Michael, can you chat with Grisha and see if you can help her out? I'm gonna show you now, I got to the end of the row and I'm just doing this little swatch in my demonstration, this little tiny swatch rather than the full dish cloth so that I we can do it Grisha more We have Grisha unmuted now. Oh, yes, Grisha, did you have a question? Well, I, I, the one thing I wanted to say is I kept hitting the unmute and it wouldn't unmute. Which I don't I know. I've never had that before. Okay, the only comment I was going to make is, and tell me if I'm wrong, Sarah. I think the 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 all these little stitches that you start with the link or whatever it's called, the first row. It's not the first row. Should be kind of, isn't it easier if it's loose? Yes. Because yes. I think mine are too tight. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. It's better when you're chaining, it's better to do it loose on the loose side. Your first row of crochet, usually if, you're, if your chains are a little bit bigger, your first row of crochet tends to pull it up. If you do it too tight, so you can see in my finished, uh, my finished um, dishcloth that it's pretty well square. But if I did my foundation really tight, my foundation chain, it literally would pull that in. Um, and make it almost like a waistline or something. And you don't want that. So yes, it's, it is important to chain loosely when you're doing your foundation. Oh, I can see that. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, so now we're gonna turn it. How do you turn okay, it? We got to the end of the first row. Now we're gonna turn. Um, so this is my first row of single crochet. And there's two ways to count it, whichever one's easier. I'm gonna put a little bit of shadow on here so you can see it a little bit better. There's two ways you could count it. Um, I don't know if you can tell, but right here there's a V. So there's a V here, 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 etc. And if I counted those, I'd have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Um, we remember we had 12 chains, but we skipped one. So that's why we have 11. There's another way to count it. And this one, it might be just a little bit cleaner when you first, especially when you first get started. And that's to look at the top, which really looks identical to your chain foundation stitches. See the V's right there? So you can count it the same way. Starting here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11. So there's 11 when we count it here. There's 11 when we count it here. Now, to turn and go back the other direction. I'll put my working uh, hands back together. Same hold as before. I'm going to use that pencil hold on the, on the needle. And I'm going to chain one before I turn. So I'm going to chain one. That's rule of thumb with single crochet. So I'm going to grab our wrap and pull through one. And then I simply take my work and turn it back in the opposite direction. So where we tend to read right to left, 
um, we crochet left to right. And so now I'm at the left hand end of the row. And, and where I'm gonna put the needle is, I'm gonna use that tip again, the tip of the hook, tip of the needle, and I'm gonna put it right here. Now, if you're wondering where that is, if you look at the top, what I've done is I've put it directly under the V-stitch with nothing else in the way. And that's where I'm putting, um, putting the hook. So once I get it through there, I wrap and pull, putting two back up onto the hook again, and then I wrap and pull through two. So let me show you again. So I go in from the front right here, which is under the V-stitch right there. Wrap and pull, two on my needle, wrap and pull. So through, wrap and pull, wrap and pull through two. Through, wrap and pull, wrap and pull through two. Through, wrap and pull, wrap, pull through two. Okay, I'm not going to play this video, but I'm going to show you um, how to count the rows right from this example right here. So this, oh, where, where we, oh, sugar. Okay, so um, this is the, this is the back side of my first single crochet row, and I know that because there's a horizontal back line for the first row and then the second row, because I remember I'm going opposite directions. Every row is, is gonna be slightly different. So every other row is gonna have this back bump. So you can see the back bump here. Here's a good one. Here's a good one. Here's a good one. So I know that that was, was when I was going the one direction. When I go the opposite direction, I get these Vs. So what I've got here is I've got two, four, six, eight, 10 rows. Um, now you can tally mark it too and keep track. Also, when you're doing your chains, the same thing. The reason that I that um, it's important to know how to count your chains is if you don't, you know, like tally mark it or use a stitch marker and you're crocheting a foundation for, a, for an Afghan, which can easily have 160 chains, you know, inadvertently for me, um, I'll be at uh, like 93 and somebody will walk in the room and ask me a question. And so either if I have, if I don't know how to count them, I either have to pull it and start over or I have to guess and neither one of those are accurate ways to do it. So knowing how to count your rows and your stitches by sight is important, but you can also track it with pen and paper. When you get done, you're gonna weave in your ends and I'm demonstrating how to do that with a crochet hook, although my preferred method you is your work. Little you need to weave your needle. ends in. Um, and you need to do that to keep it from unraveling. If I were to cut this off right here um, and make it nice and neat, this yarn would actually pull out through that loop and my work would unravel. So to um, weave it in, um, there's two, two ways that you can do it. Um, one is with a crochet hook and one is with a yarn needle, which is, looks like a sewing needle with an eye in it. That was, that was um, this. That's a little bit bigger, but you basically what you do, and, and there's no particular rhyme or reason to this. You're just catching that thread um, and pulling it through the stitches and winding it through. I tend to go down here um, and go, try to go through the back of my work, the back side of my, my piece, whatever the back side is, and just um, pull, that, pull that through. And I do that until I've gone through at least five stitches um, and kind of hidden that yarn inside. Uh, inside so you can't see it. Um, so, and you can do it one stitch at a time. Um, as you get, you know, used to it, you could probably go through more than one stitch at a time. Um, let's see if I can just show you what I mean. You can pick up, like I could go through this, and I could go through this, and I could go through this all at once and hide my, um, hide my thread 
under three stitches by pulling that through all three stitches at one time, which can be good. Sometimes it can actually take more time than the other. So then once you pull it through, once you get it through enough stitches, I always stretch it a little bit and make sure that it's, you know, guts not gonna pull loose. Um, and then I just cut it off right next to the work. Like that, and this goes in the package. When you get any questions on, um, on weaving in the ends. I'm also gonna skip this video, but I'm gonna show you on my little swatch that ripping a mistake is super easy in crocheting, unlike knitting. Uh, I think I think ripping and knitting can be challenging, but in crocheting, you can't you can't get a run going up and down. So literally, if you have a mistake, you can just pull it back as far as you need to pull it um, and and fix your mistake and then move forward. Um, so fixing a mistake is a little bit more forgiving in crocheting than it is in knitting. All right, so here's a recap. You insert your hook front to back where the stitch is gonna go. You do that yarn over, or what I was calling grabbing the yarn. You pull up a loop, which creates two loops on the hook. You do a yarn over and pull it through both, both loops on the hook. Once you master a single crochet, which by the way in the UK is called a double crochet, once you master that, um, really every crochet stitch is kind of a variation of it. So the common crochet stitches are uh, half double crochet, double crochet, treble crochet, and they're all variations of the single crochet stitch. You're just wrapping and pulling through different numbers of yarns on your hook. So if you can get that down, you'll be good. And then, as I said, I'll, I should be launching an intermediate class in the next couple of weeks. So you could come back, you know, ask me questions, come back to my beginning one, or you could come to the intermediate one and ask me some questions. But I'd love to, to know that you're able to really do this um, as a result of participating. These are common abbreviations. Um, you can Google this, you know, common uh, crochet abbreviations. Just know that they're going to uh, abbreviate. And that's where it's kind of like breaking the code a little bit. So a chain, that foundation uh, row that we did is abbreviated CH or CHS sometimes if there's multiples. Single crochet, what we learned today is always abbreviated SC. This is the half double crochet. This is the double crochet, treble crochet. Sometimes if you've got two colors, you'll see MC for main color, CC for contrasting color. Let me read this to you so that you understand what it's saying. In this example, it's saying chain one, and it's defining in parentheses that we call that the turning chain. Remember when I was starting row two, I said you chain one first. If you don't do that, your sides are going to scrunch down. Right, so that turning chain is important. If you were doing double crochet, you'd probably chain three. Um, and then it's telling us to single crochet in the first single crochet. And so to me, it's like, what? What is that saying? This, this single crochet is a verb. Single crochet, like do a single crochet in the first single crochet stitch. Now it's a noun from the row before. So in this, so it's saying single crochet in the first single crochet stitch from the row before. Then we've got brackets. And in the, in the brackets, it says chain one, skip the next single crochet, single crochet in the next single crochet 16 times. The brackets are telling us that whatever is in those brackets are what you're going to repeat to the end of the row. Um, and then turn. And what that's doing, where we did every stitch was a single crochet stitch, what that's doing and what this is doing is it's leaving a, a space in between everyone, making a more lacy pattern. Um, so that's just a little wet your whistle on that. I also am going to be teaching a class that is just on reading patterns if you're struggling with that. Here's some examples of some things that I've made. This is my favorite, favorite baby Afghan pattern. I've made this for all of my grandchildren so far. Um, this is a pattern um, that I made for my bed. 
Uh, I use that on my bed right now. This is a, these are a variation of what they call the granny square. These are actually diamonds rather than squares, but they're made very similar to a granny square. And then they were crocheted together. Um, this is the rug that I was telling you about that I use that great big crochet hook with and use strips of fabric and crocheted that rug. We were in an older house. Oh, sorry. We were in an older house that we were remaking and I just needed something temporary. Um, and this actually is one of the slippers. This one's my husband's, I believe, um, that was made out of 100% wool and shrunk on purpose um, to make it fit his foot. I've made something like 50 pairs of these slippers. I give them as gifts and people come back and ask for more and more and more and more of those. That's actually uh, knitted, but you can do the same thing with crocheting. This is a different variation of a granny square. This is the, what is it, hexagon, I think, six-sided. This is Tunisian crochet, which looks like a combination of a knitting needle and a crochet needle. That's a different technique yet. This was a baby afghan done in the colors that the gal had wanted for her baby. This is a simple crochet stitch, and I made decorations for these American Girl outfits that I uh, that I um, sewed. I've also done these as hair things for my grandkids and my children when my children were little. That's a lot of fun. Um, this is, remember I was saying that little tiny needle uses uh, cotton thread. This is how the cotton thread is sold. And what I do is I sew together um, a flannel, two layers of flannel, and then I crochet uh, an edging around it and give those as baby gifts um, very very fun way to dress them up my daughter-in-law loves elephants and this is an elephant edging that I put on uh, on her blanket for her and that's that cotton crochet edge and this is a close-up of one that I'm doing for a uh, grandchild that I have due in June um, so the free resource or the free uh, dishcloth pattern I'm going to put in the email that comes to you in a few minutes um, and we are out of time. I want to give you a chance to ask your questions, however. So if you want to stay on, um, you can do that. Um, you can, if you have questions or comments, you can email Liz. These are some of my classes that I'll be teaching next. Um, you'll get class notes with resources in it when we're done. You can give me feedback by clicking on that little uh, orange oval and you can you can uh, rate me with stars. You can give me comments on the, on the session. You can give me comments on myself. You can give me ideas for future classes. I read every one of these. So I love your feedback. It's very helpful to me, especially in customizing future uh, classes. And we always love to have you invite a friend. So with that, I'm gonna stop my share. I'm gonna go back over here and I, I'll stay on for a few minutes in case anybody has any last questions that they'd like to ask about crocheting. If not, we'll see you in the next class. On your very large crochet hook, I had a friend growing up whose mother crocheted and she was from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where it stayed very cold for a long time. She would take two pieces of yarn and yeah. put them together and crochet with the large hook. Yeah. It made some super warm blankets. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't very good for down in the South, but boy, I bet they kept you toasty up in Milwaukee. <laughs> yeah, I, I crochet, I'm in Michigan. And I crochet all winter long and I love to make afghans because they keep me warm. <laughs> so I'm right there with you. <laughs> and the blankets do make a, a nice uh, gift for your grandchildren. Uh, one of my daughter-in-laws asked if I would make something when the first grandchild came along. Her mother had a tradition of making something handmade for the grandbabies, like a Christmas stocking. And yep. she said that since I could make blankets because I was working with the church group that made prayer shawls to give oh, to cancer God. patients. Yes. And she asked for a big square one. And she said that would be the hand-me-down gift to the baby that each of the babies that came along, I've now made them a blanket of their very own. And they have a keepsake from their grandmother. 
Absolutely. I was, um, I have a daughter that's due actually any day, uh, Sunday, this coming Sunday is her official due date. And I was taking uh, one of those flannel blankets to her and I got in the elevator in the, she lives in a condo, high rise condo. And I was in the elevator and a, an older lady was in there with me and she said, did you make that? And I said, yes. And she goes, oh my gosh, that is a keepsake. That is a keepsake, you know, and that was just a stranger. <laughs> yes, and I received a flannel blanket like that from my mother-in-law when my first was born, and it had been hand crocheted through there, mm -hmm. and it did give the idea of go make one of those little flannel blankets. In yeah. fact, make two, because they said if it becomes a lovey and you can't get it away from them at nap time, make two so you can swap them out. <laughs> like that I and you can stitch around the edge of those and they are beautiful and again another keepsake for the baby that they know that grandma cared enough to make them something that's right it, it, I just I love handmade gifts so my kids are kind of stuck with them <laughs> All right well it's been so nice to be with you all and uh, come back and see me again sometime. Well, it was so nice to watch how you did that. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you. You're Thank welcome. You. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome.